The Crab with the Golden Claws is the ninth adventure of Hergé's Tintin, and was first published in 1941. It is arguably the greatest of the tales of a nosy young man and his small fluffy dog, not because it was featured in an episode of The Simpsons, because its appearance happened in an episode of season 20, and really who cares about The Simpsons post season 14. Not me. Anyway, it must be thought of by some to be a good story, because in the past 70 years there have been four very different adaptations of the comic book. The first was the first moving version of Tintin via stop motion in 1947. It is definitely the closest to a perfect faithful adaptation as you can get, as it follows every single panel of the comic, with only a couple of missing moments. The biggest one, despite it being featured at the opening of the film, is the sequence where Tintin and his new ally, Captain Haddock, are attacked by... Uh... Whoa, whoa, don't go! The second adaptation was in 1959, when The Crab with the Golden Claws was the second Tintin adventure to be animated into 8-minute episodes for television. Made by Belvision Studios, seven adventures were adapted into a total of 102 episodes. With animation of the highest calibre, the retelling of the classic comics are well-intentioned, but a bit flimsy. The third adaptation came in 1991. In this series, the stories contained a combination of faithful beats and entertaining changes, sometimes for the better, such as in Tintin and the Picaros, where the Belgian hero doesn't refuse to help save his acquaintances, or allow his best friends to visit a tropical dictatorship without him. Although the episodes have since been released onto DVD in order of the original stories, they were all made and broadcast in a completely different order, with The Crab with the Golden Claws being the first episode. And finally, in 2011, which to date has been the last time Tintin has been lifted off the pages, the Adventures of Tintin movie mixed together the plots and characters of The Secret of the Unicorn and The Crab with the Golden Claws. The only main similarity to the original comic is that after being kidnapped via the Secret of the Unicorn, Tintin is taken not to Marlin Spike Hall, care of the Bird Brothers, but to the Caribou Jean, where he begrudgingly befriends its drunken captain. They then wind up in the middle of the desert, and after bumping into Thompson and Thompson, disguised as Omar Ben Salad, the movie returns to being a very loose Hollywood interpretation of Secret of the Unicorn. Now usually in these videos I go over every alteration I can find, from the considerably minor to the hefty, but for this particular video I'm only going to be looking out for the biggest differences from the two versions of this comic that were adapted for television. So let's begin with the top 10 times that the 1959 Hergé's Adventures of Tintin episode went astray from the comic. We're off to round up the counterfeiters! Well, you must get these brakes <laughs> The episode begins with Tintin and Snowy on their way to visit their friend Captain Haddock on board his ship, the Caribou Jean. While at the docks, they witness two men dumping a body bag into the sea. This already creates a massive change to the original story, as Tintin had never met Haddock before page 14 of The Crab with the Golden Claws, and he wasn't a witness to the murder of Herbert Dawes. He only found out about it after visiting the Thompson's office. There's a body in the water. Nobody we know. The crooked crew of the Caribou Jean are smuggling the drug opium, hidden inside tins of crab meat. In this episode, however, they are smuggling diamonds. Hands of crab meat! Like the label found on that poor seaman! It is uncertain whether the villainous Alan, who had a small but equally sinister role in a previous Tintin comic, is responsible for causing Haddock's dependence on booze, or if he is simply exploiting the captain's thirst. In this episode adaptation, he has instead been drugged into a groggy stupor, which wears off by the time he and Tintin escape the ship, which is much more of an ordeal than it is in the comic. This is mutiny! Mutiny! <laughs> Poor Captain Haddock, he's still drugged. In the comic, there are two pilots who attempt to kill Tintin and Haddock, who catch them off guard and take them prisoner. 
In the episode, only the one with the moustache appears, who, during the turbulent flight, manages to untie himself and knocks out our heroes. While Tintin remains KO'd, Haddock beats up the pilot, which results in the plane crash landing. This minor villain actually tries to warn the young man in the original story, as it is the captain who hits him with the bottle, having drunk its contents first, making him cross that Tintin won't let him fly the plane. Where's the gear shift on this windmill? While crossing the desert, our heroes are attacked by Ahmed the Terrible. That's me! During the chase, Tintin sprains his ankle, which is hardly surprising considering they are as thick as twigs. When resting at an oasis, they are caught by the pilot who orders the desert rat to shoot them for a share of the diamonds Tintin had kept in his pocket as evidence. Diamonds! Just when all seems lost for Tintin and the captain, Ahmed kills the pilot and makes our heroes hostages, so he can claim a ransom. But they escape thanks to Snowy and a camel. The only ordeal Tintin and Haddock have while crossing the desert in the original story is that the captain suffers from mirages. The other main difference of this whole sequence is that it apparently never occurs to the men to take off their sweaters. Run for it! Going someplace, Saeed? Uh, just stretching me legs, you pirate. After passing out from dehydration, Tintin Snowy and the Captain are found and brought to Lieutenant Delcourt's fort. In this episode, Tintin wakes up at the fort once he passes out, though this is caused by a sandstorm similar to the Land of Black Gold, which incidentally Hergé had started writing in 1939, which explains why Captain Haddock is absent until the final part of the adventure. Run for it, boy! Run where? In your port in a storm, boy! Instead of travelling to Morocco via camel, the lieutenant's aide drives them across the desert. They are attacked by Ahmed the Terrible and one of the fort's soldiers, because... Diamonds! As in the comic, our heroes are saved by the arrival of Delcourt and his men, although it is not explained why they followed them. Ahmed the Terrible is now Ahmed the Peaceful. A drunken haddock recognises his ship, which the villains have tried to disguise by changing its name to the Jabala Mela. In the episode, the captain is sober, and the name is changed to Tangiers. Did you not hear the news? The Caire Bojan was reported lost at sea. Between Haddock being kidnapped and the arrival of Detectives Thompson and Thompson, Alan spots Tintin and lures him into a dead end, where he arranges for a taxi driver to run over Tintin. But the young man avoids death by lying flat on the ground. We gotta call the police! Alan and his crew sail away on the Caribou Jean with Tintin and Haddock in pursuit via a police boat they pinched. The villains unload the diamonds onto a spare boat and leave your standard bundle of dynamite with a long lighted fuse, awaiting the heroes when they come aboard. This ends up backfiring. In the comic, the final battle takes place on speedboats and only Tintin and Alan are involved. Where'd he hit you, boy? I wasn't hit. I slipped and fell. I'll have words with that seagoing policeman. Rough words. Now let's see what the five biggest changes to the story were made in the 1991 TV series, The Adventures of Tintin. You there. I'll open that sack immediately. Excuse me, sir, but would you mind if we checked your sack? When Tintin sees that outside his apartment a Japanese man is being attacked by some men, he and Snowy rush downstairs and start fighting them, eventually getting knocked out. This definitely adds a lot more action to the scene than the comic contained, as in that Tintin arrives too late, and instead is given a full account of what happened from his weeping landlady. What in the world is going on? I don't know, ma'am. But I intend to find out! While exploring the ship he has been taken prisoner aboard, Tintin finds the kidnapped Japanese man, Bunji Karaki. Our hero tries to free the officer, but as the crew are near, Bunji insists he leave him and finds a way to contact the police. In the original story, once captured, Bunji is not seen again until the very end of the comic, which is where he gives his four panels worth of exposition. 
It is never revealed in either source why the villains were keeping him locked up in their ship, and didn't just murder him, as they did to his informer, Herbert Dawes. The crowd team you were looking for is one of thousands that Harin and his men used to smuggle narcotics. Drug smugglers. Captain Haddock's drunkenness is completely toned down, as it was in every episode of this series. In fact, his desire for alcohol was only ever touched upon in scenes where it was vital to the plot, like Explorers on the Moon and Tintin and the Picaros. Hergé's interpretation of drunken behaviour seemed to mostly focus on a stammer. Slurred speech perhaps would have been the more obvious route, but to be honest, reading Haddock's stuttering dialogue after he has consumed one too many glasses of whiskey is about as frustrating as having a conversation with a drunk person in real life. Anyway, in the original story, Haddock gets drunk five times. In this episode, it is only suggested that Haddock is drunk, as besides having double vision, which was likely caused by Tintin knocking him on the back of the head twice, the only indication that he is slightly not sober is that instead of launching into one of his trademark bouts of anger, he cries when he learns that his first mate has betrayed his trust. The absence of Haddock's constant desire for whiskey and wine was possibly due to the producers of the cartoon wanting the character to seem less pathetic, but probably they were not allowed to flaunt the notion of mild behaviour-altering substances. Alan's a good sailor. Loyal, devoted, and generous with the whiskey. Like with the first made-for-TV version of this comic, only one of the pilots appears, but rather than knock out both men, he only strikes Tintin. The airmen become unconscious after the plane crashes onto the desert, and they escape while our heroes' backs are turned. But in the episode, the pilot escapes before the plane even lands, as he and his parachute bail out after cracking Tintin on the noggin. Get your nose up! Flip your flaps! Full power to the prop! We're gonna crash! Once Tintin finds Haddock, who is being beaten for information, Alan escapes. Tintin chases after the first mate, leaving Haddock to keep an eye on the rest of the villains. He tosses the captain a gun without untying him first. This short scene plays out very differently and much longer in the comic. So happy to be rescued, Haddock hugs Tintin, causing him to drop his gun. The trio are chased by the villains, and hide in a wine cellar where they get high off the fumes, which provokes the captain to turn Super Sailor, knocking out Alan and chasing after the crew. The duo soon sober up after a piece of plaster shot down by the head of the drug smuggling operation taps Tintin on the head, and Haddock is brought to his senses by a policeman's battle. We're conducting an investigation. A very discreet investigation. And what is the nature of your investigation, gentlemen? We, we think you're smuggling, smuggling drugs. <sighs> By the beard of the prophet, how dare you? Clearly, the early 90s version of this classic comic is more faithful than the late 50s one. But that one is certainly not unfaithful to the point of insult. None of the character designs from the book are altered, and besides the name of the ship, even a minor character like Delcourt wasn't changed, or lost in translation. The lengthy middle portion of this episode's plot, where it definitely went off course, was due to the absence of the comic's beginning, since it starts with Tintin already at the docks, which doesn't happen till page 10. In conclusion, if you're a Tintin fan, don't forget to check out the stop animated version of this comic, made in 1947. You can even use the actual comic to translate the dialogue. <laughs> What's so special about the claws? The entire crab is gold!